Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. Recently, the provincial government announced the allocation of wood supply. A lot of voices at play, from industry, which has its needs and its growth patterns, from those in the Private Woodlot Owners Federation looking to get their wood to market through industry, and the environmentalists and activists who see the land in a very different way from how industry does. Clearly, there's a need for a new narrative in how these three voices and agendas come together. Today's guest is going to provide us with great insight and compassion about this relationship, as well as some technical knowledge on what is going on with the forests in our province. We're really pleased today to have Ken Hardy from the Small Woodlot Owners Federation with us. Uh, the timing for this is March 18th, um, just last week, March 18th, 2014, just last week, the government announced um, its crown allocation of wood supply. It's been a lot of buzz. We're definitely going to get into that for a bit. But first, Ken, thanks for coming. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah. So you've been a busy guy. It's, <laughs> it's been pretty hectic since the announcement last week. Mm. So uh, maybe as an intro, in general terms, um, what's your take on it? And we'll put on the website uh, the links underneath for recent news stories for the backstory. But well, so I, I, the, 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 the forest strategy, the announcement that was made last week is, uh, revolves around I industry investing in mills, mm. more or less in a trade-off for more crown wood. Uh, <coughs> the the outcry has been mainly around the fact that uh, we've been told for many years in other lead-ups that uh, the wood on Crown was essentially maxed out in terms of sustainably being available, what they call AAC, annual allowable cut. Okay. So f for at least the last two and a half years, uh, any government briefings or announcement, it was it was kind of the doom and gloom you know, we're in the bottom of a cycle, there isn't any wood, we're going to have to weather, our way, and then we'll start creeping up again. So for this announcement to come, uh, clearly this additional wood is going to have to come from what they call the conservation forest or constrained areas. And not only woodlot owners, but everybody in New Brunswick should be concerned about that. Yeah, it's hard for a good point about everyone in New Brunswick should be concerned. Uh, the general jokey public won't have it on their radar. They'll catch the, the key bullets and stuff, but the general picture, it's as if there should be a map somewhere <laughs> that goes chop, 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 and this is what we're talking about. And this shaded area is the difference from 10 years ago to what was just proposed last week. Because some people are visual learners and there's a lot of information around. Yeah, clearly. And, and, I, and I shouldn't undermine our own issues because, y you know, we're... we're the woodlot owners, there's 41,000 woodlot owners in the province. We, we own just a little under 2 million hectares of productive forest. Mm. Uh, our, our key business over the years through the associations I represent, the seven marketing boards, is the selling of forest products or selling logs, studwood, pulpwood. So yeah. <coughs> it seems counterintuitive if you put more crown wood into the system and yet government's contending there'll be opportunities for us. We, w that's probably one of the key things we're having a hard time understanding. Okay. So there's an issue of balance or access or where the development should happen or the growth should happen? Well, I, I, fundamentally it's market access. Okay. And, and market access for private woodlot, woodlot wood has been an issue for over 20 years. Yeah, there's stuff about price points, and I remember reading news stories with uh, small wildlife owner operators saying that I can't sell enough wood to even cover the gas for me to, as gas prices went up. Yeah, so, it's I mean, here's an ad, you know, that it'll cause a chuckle, but it's an Irving ad about on track for the largest purchase of uh, woodlot wood ever, which is probably true to a degree, but it doesn't give the detail. Uh, what it's like from the woodlot owner's point of view. Well, Dennis, you're, you're right. In fact, they are probably going to buy uh, more woodlot wood this year than they have in the recent past. Mm. But you have to understand that in some, re especially in some regions, in the, in the province overall, but in some regions, yeah. 
we're essentially in a monopoly situation. Yeah. There's nowhere else to sell your wood. Yep. If you live in and around Sussex, New Brunswick, for example, yep. there's only one place to sell your wood. That's to J.D. Irving Limited. And secondary to that is uh, the best way we could describe our relationship is probably quite rocky these days yeah. uh, between the marketing boards and the Federation and J.D. Irving. Mm. So that wood is all being purchased basically on their terms. There, There's... Sounds There's like no <laughs> negotiation. <laughs> it sounds like Walmart. When, uh, when Walmart goes to the manufacturer and says, here's what you're going to make this product for, otherwise we won't carry it on our, on our shelves. Yeah, and I mean, you know, privately in meetings, so, you know, because we, we still on occasion do talk with JDI representatives. You know, they, they portray it as being a really good thing. Hmm. But the real sad pawns in this thing are the producers, the contractors, the guys with the trucks and the chainsaws yep. and the equipment. Yep. They're trying to make a living and they have no choice. They have no negotiation rights. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's essentially here's the price of wood, take, take it, it or leave it. it. Yep. The, um, outside of the realm of that detail, um, something else crosses the mind re really quick. At some point it's a finite universe. Like New Brunswick isn't very big in terms of our global market competitiveness, or even on our, what we produce in forest products um, nationally. I think I read somewhere once that uh, New Brunswick was like 2% of the national total of forest industry, in general terms. So for us, it's big, but on a bigger scale, when you change the scale, um, what happens if something changes out there? A China changes and India changes, and reading the Irving announcements, um, last week with uh, going back into the mills and investing, you know, 500 million plus into retrofitting. When interviewing Peter Linfield on the show in the past, um, he talked about the forest industry is going to go through some major changes in the next 20 years. And New Brunswick might be well advised to start looking for other alternatives or other uses instead of what's always worked since the 1950s and 60s. Does that cross your guys' path at all? Like for those small woodlot owner operators, that's their one thing they've got. But do they have any radar up that at some point this is going to have to change? I, I, I would say that most well-informed folks in the forest business on private land and woodlot owners, they, they, you know, they watch the news and they see the, the print media and, and, and they understand that and, and they understand the effect of, you know, the housing crash in the U.S. and what it did to lumber and and they understand, well, you only have to look at a map of Canada, and New Brunswick isn't a really big place, yep. but forestry has always been king here yep. in terms of you know, wages and GDP. Yeah. But, but we do need to change. I guess the, the point I would make, Dennis, because you often hear, uh, especially uh, Mr. Irving himself, will talk about, you know, we're in a global market, we gotta be competitive. We understand that and we respect that, but as a producer of wood, mm. we, we're not selling our pulp wood in a global market. We're selling our wood in New Brunswick. Yeah, yeah. And, and don't you all sometimes wonder, well, who decided that's the way it has to be? Not from the local market one, but the world market one. Like, who decided that's the way it has to go? It, it isn't necessarily a foregone conclusion that that's the growth pattern. Um, maybe it needs to be... Uh, a zero growth pattern rather than in order to succeed we need to keep growing. At, at some point that logic stops. Well, I, I, think, I think you're, you're bang on. I think, I think we need to take a step back and look at how our industry has matured and I think there's things we can do better. Hmm. We should be better at it because we are smaller. We should be able to adjust quicker. Yes. We should be much more uh, flexible. Well, earlier you'd mentioned that this should be a good news story, and yet all of the friction that it's going to and has elicited is taken away from that good news story, like where you're heading now with. Well, yeah, what a, you know, that's what I was saying in the lead-in before. Is yeah. you know, the news that there's going to be a large influx of capital, improving mills, creating jobs, should be a good news story. Hmm. And, uh, and I would suggest that David Allworth, our premier, and the government has missed an opportunity. Hmm. If they had just taken a little bit different look at how they rolled out this strategy, hmm. uh, it could have been a much more positive outcome. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll explain that briefly, if I may. Hmm. Is there 
industry wants more wood in order to make these capital investments. Makes sense. We, as woodlawn owners, we, we have wood available sustainably. Like we're not cutting up to our maximum annual allowable cut, that what I mentioned earlier, that yep. sustainable level. So we, we have wood, whereas the crown, crown land, which is public land, you always gotta remember that's public land, yep. is essentially maxed out. And that's why the environmental conservation side is so excited because they know that that wood's gonna have to come out of those deer yards and those stream buffers and the old growth forest. If the government had a little bit, a little innovative, and it could have been a real positive thing because they could have maybe instituted some policy or some recommendations that a portion, we're going to support you in your investments, Mr. Industry. Yeah. Uh, here's some crown wood, but you need to purchase some private wood. Balance it out. Everybody potentially could be a winner. So somewhere in behind the scenes is the logic that when you access crown lands, it's somehow cheaper or more cost effective than buying it from small woodlot owners. Meanwhile, is that right? That would be an industry perspective? Because why would they be wanting to go there if there's a ready supply coming from the other sources that, that creates the spinoff back into the province and keeps your, your team busy? Yeah, well, I mean, it's part of it has to do with the economics, the pricing, hmm. because wood off a crown, the pricing is set in a very convoluted process and the, how they access the licensees, especially the system we have of licensees and sub-licensees, access to crown, they have exclusive access. So they have total control. Hmm. So the control component is, I would suggest, almost as important as the pricing because uh, they can control everything. Whereas in the woodlot sector, you're basically you got to deal with seven marketing boards, negotiate. Uh, okay. You know, so yeah. it's it's a little bit more complex. And, and is there a revenue stream for um, the industry side from the government? Like, does the government pay the industry side at all for management of crown lands? Do, like, do they make? Yeah, and that, and that that, <laughs> that 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 you know that, that's you've hit the nail right on the head. I mean. Uh, because of transparency issues, I would suggest with the government and how the government puts the information out. Hmm. But to answer your question directly, yes. Okay. They get paid a set figure. They, they used to be referred to as overhead. They now call it forest management expenses. Okay. And it's essentially the costs, it's to compensate the industry for the costs incurred of managing the piece of crown land that they're managing. That, that number currently is $5.15 a cubic meter. Okay. So, for example, <coughs> hardwood pulpwood, the, the, uh, the royalty rate is, is uh, I believe, $7.53 a cubic meter. You take that five fifteen off of it. So, hardwood pulpwood, the royalty rate, what they have to pay back to the government is, is $2.37. It's the balance. You know, whereas if they're buying private wood, the, the prices now for private wood at hardwood pulp users is in the $44, $48 a cubic meter range. But, but to be fair, the price I'm quoting for wood, that, that's delivered to the mill. The royalty rate the industry pays, they have to cut it and get it to the mill. Yep. But still, and this is where it gets very confusing, yeah. is those royalty rates for the different products are set by the government by doing what they call a fair market value survey mm. of stumpage prices on woodlots. Mm. So we've always contended in the period of the survey, the survey is usually done by a consultant. Mm. They hire a consultant to do it and he Th third surveys. Third objective, <coughs> more or less. But they're using us so we contend essentially if industry can keep our prices low, especially in the period of the survey, hmm. then that in turn has the effect of making their royalty rates on Crown go down. And that's probably not a really good explanation. There's other people that could explain it better yeah. than I, even though I understand it. <laughs> uh, but that's what the general public don't understand. Yeah. Is, is the assumption is, and common sense would tell you, that those prices would be set by looking at what the market's doing, 
how products are performing, you know, hopefully on a North American basis, maybe even a global basis, yeah. and then the government went set. And then, uh, Dennis, the ultimate bottom line is the fact that people have to understand our Crown land loses money. Hmm. Between that payment they get paid for force management expenses and what gets paid back as royalty, hmm. the difference two years ago was a $15 million loss. So it's a net loss to the people of the province. Yeah, we're you and I, and we're all subsidizing that essentially. Yeah, that's another, that's part of that. Uh, the activists have talked about corporate welfare stuff or the way money streams. So at that point though, has it always been this way? Is, is this a recent phenomenon? Can this go back to the 60s? It, it uh, goes back to, to, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it goes back to 82 when the Crown Lands and Forest Act came in. So it's, it's a bit of an entrenched behavior which gets hard to nudge because people get used to a pattern. Meanwhile, there's been global shifts in global markets and global production skill sets and stuff. And then here's Little New Brunswick trying to get a balance for its parts. So I'm glad you wandered into the deep end because you know, this show can facilitate that. We can take our time and make the information available. So then what, what is the balancing mechanism that you think should be in place or you feel should be in place between stumpage fees, the way we subsidize by 15 million back to industry, and of course that won't count the other cookies that are handed out for retrofitting mills and stuff. Uh, um, from other sources of revenue from the government. And then for your team, what they need because it sounds like a, well it is, you've described that they're stuck. This is their market and this is where they live and there's a lot of them. Yeah. A and so naturally it would have seemed that industry should have gone the small woodlot owner's route if they needed more volume to meet the retrofit demands in 2012 to 2014 to be competitive in 2020 to 2030. Well, as you said, the, <coughs> the model needs to change and I think what we have to reflect on is the, the piece of legislation that governs Crown Forest as a Crown Lands and Forest Act came into effect 82. Hmm. Hasn't been changed since 82. Hmm. Just take a moment and think how much our world sense. has changed yeah. since 82. Yeah, and on the flip side, or connected to that, but on the positive side, I'm thinking, but there's got to be some amazing examples of forest practices that have changed since 82 that would get us over this hump of this conflict model that is, you know, because Mr. Kuhn will always talk about clear cut, clear cut, but there's Baker Brook as an example of a really good, uh, well managed, uh, diverse, um, more yield per hectare kind of forest. So can New Brunswick get, get past itself in order to get to the models that really work? So this becomes a positive story and we can see the next hundred years and not the next four? Yeah, well again, again, I would contend it's a matter of balance. If, if you want to, use Baker Brook, which is an incredible model of, of forestry and growing a lot of fiber, a lot of wood per hectare. That's one. Super. Yeah, but, but there's community-based <coughs> models as well. There's community-based and there's, you know, in the world I work in and with woodlot owners, a lot of our woodlot owners, I mean, we have clear cuts on woodlots. They're generally a heck of a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but overall, I would suggest our management style is a little bit more selective and, but that kind of management is more expensive. Hmm. And, and then that's what drives uh, the Crown Land clear cut is economically, the, the economic bottom line, that's the, the most effective way to get a volume of wood off a piece of ground. Yeah. But sometimes I think some people are being a little disingenuous in the actual cost they're not looking at the cost of establishing that plantation after the clear cut. They're not looking at the whole pie. Yeah, the full circle. Exactly. Because yeah, earlier when you were talking about some of it, uh, I wanted to go, but it was too soon to get into, okay, industry goes in and does this, and they've got this contract with the government for supply and management of it. But that only seems to go three quarters of the circle, and it never takes <coughs> care of the last quarter, which is, because it's, it's, to me it's exciting that forestry is renewable. But your cycle is a 60 to 100 year cycle, or whatever you want to choose, but it's a lot longer than a four year election cycle, or a pattern that happens within industry when there's a shift in housing markets and stuff. So it's like we need a clutch that moves between all those different gears to allow the forest to do what it does, and industry actually nurtures back what it took so that it completes that. And is that better on an industry wide scale, or would community based forestry be the best at that? 
so that industry goes in, does its thing, and then community base comes in behind it and manages it? Or can you walk us through what that rest of that cycle might look like? Well, I mean, community-based, the, the strength there would be the transparency hmm. if, you, if you have the players in the community, including industry. Yeah. I mean, that's where there's sometimes there's a little bit of a misconception. People think, well, we talk about community, it's going to be, you know, all the nuts and berries people and the environmental people and the like hunters and, <laughs> and, and we're not going to let the big industry in. But if it's going to work, you've got to have everybody around the table. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a matter of just changing the model mm -hmm. and assessing everybody's needs and, again, getting back to a balance. But, I mean, that being said, I wouldn't say, you know, that's another thing that's somewhat of a personal opinion, maybe not our whole association, but I think my guys would support me on this, is we don't have to, it doesn't have to be all one way or all the other. It could be a whole patchwork quilt of community forests, uh, licensees with clear cuts and plantations, selection, the maple producers, uh, everything fits as long as it's driving our economy. It, it, well, if it was an investment portfolio, isn't there some logic somewhere about diversifying so that you don't have one strength all focused in one area, and if that's at risk, the whole thing goes down? Logically, it makes sense to, to create that new pattern. Yeah, and I mean, one, one real good example I would suggest right now is there's a certain real high level of concern, and the federal government has committed $18 million to budworm. Hmm. Yes, you know, yes, and yes. so it's coming from Quebec. We we know it. The scientists tell us that. So industry is very concerned, and, and they they should be concerned because they have these monocultures of plantations of what these bugs like to eat. Yep. So that forest may not be as resilient as the woodlot next door that's a mixed wood with with ash and maple and and fir and spruce and hemlock. Yep. So it's it's complex, but. But like but you it said, it, it needs to be <laughs> diversified. I agree yeah. 100%. Yeah. So you've talked about the, the legislation from 82 and how it needs to change. Amongst your group or personally, do you have a pattern what that could be like? Do you have a vision for what, what it could be and then start that narrative? Well, <clears throat> I guess probably one of the most recent public statements we've made was back in November of 11 at the Forest Summit which is something the all government committed to make happen soon after they were elected. You know, we essentially said, look, we got to, we can't leave the fox in charge of the hen house anymore. Hmm. You know, because we got industry managing the land, industry running the mills. There are models out there of third party managers. Okay. You know, where I guess the simplest way to explain it is you have government representing the public, which we could question <laughs> these days. It's a whole but, other show. But should, uh, you know, setting policies and goals for the land, the public land, yeah. then you have a manager that's essentially engaged or contracted to implement those policies. And then you have industry that would still have essentially the access hmm. and access to the wood. Whereas right now, the industry it controls the whole cycle. And to a certain degree, you know, the, the very rich uh, tend to control the agenda. And I, I would suggest the recent strategy is an example of that. Hmm. And, and conversely with that, what happens is the public gets pushed aside, again, which I would suggest happen. And Ultimately, that's not very dem democratic. Yeah. So, that, I mean, there is opportunities. And, and also, you got to remember, since 80, in 82, uh, I guess I wasn't involved, or, but history and readings tell me that in 82, there was some folks with wisdom that said the system needs to change pre-82, because mm -hmm. it was essentially, as I understand, just a whole mishmash of everybody operating on Crown Land. Mm -hmm. So they tried to bring some organization to it. Mm -hmm. And then in those days, there were, were 12 licensees, 12, I believe, perhaps 10. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're down to four. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing that's changed dramatically. Uh, from a woodlot perspective, in 82, 
kind of the trade-off by saying, okay, the licensees will manage and have management rights over the crown land, but the woodlot owners will come first in the hierarchy of deliver what the concept was called primary source of supply. Okay. And for many years, well, from, well, actually from 82 to 92, in our opinion, it worked quite well. Okay. Because companies had to go to the woodlot marketing boards, to our organizations, and say, here's what we want to purchase. There'd be a negotiation. And in most cases, the deal was made and the, the schedule set out the wood, how the wood be delivered. Hmm. And, and that was kind of the trade-off. Here's how the woodlot owner is going to be taken care of. And industry, here's how you're going to have access. Uh, and like I said, that it worked. It worked well for many years, uh, and it uh, it was a trade-off, so that woodlocks would continue to be managed, and there would be opportunity. In '92, it got changed a bit. The government of the day made some subtle changes to the act that basically started us down this road of undoing the the concept. Mm -hmm. And and when we say primary source of supply, another key point that gets missed is even. As woodland owners, even if we could sell every stick of wood that we could sustainably manage, mm -hmm. we would still never be the prime supplier of industry. We just don't have enough wood. Mm -hmm. So, and it, and historically, for many mm -hmm. many years, we were always, you know, from the '60s through to the '90s, delivered 27 percent of the wood needs of industry. Now, since that time, it's it's you know it's got as low as seven percent. So I mean that's that's a pretty quick s historical sketch, but yeah. I well, think I think it sort of explains where we're at. Yeah, and it it triggered for me um, part of the research for this, and and maybe it bridges into something, maybe not, because it gets to can we keep growing, um, or can we get into the renewable aspect? Pay more respect to how long it takes for that forest to come back once it's been touched by humans. So this is a, a fun little book called A Short History of Progress by Ronald Wright. He talks about the relationship civilization has with its forests, but he'll look at it over a thousand years and uses Easter Island as one of his examples. So here's a civilization that chopped every stick of wood down, and then it got infested with rats and infested with other things, and then people couldn't live there anymore. And in, um, in prepping for today, there's this little paragraph I'd like to read because it ties to almost exactly what you said. But we can be so busy here in New Brunswick, we might miss that there's big changes going on outside. And then it'll come, oh, I didn't know that was coming, even though all the indicators were there 10 years before. So if civilization is to survive, it must live on the interest, meaning the interest generated by nature, provide, nature's the capital, and then mm -hmm. live off the interest from that capital from nature. Um, if civilization is to survive, it must live off the interest, not the capital, of nature. Ecological markers suggest that in the early 1960s, humans were using about 70% of nature's yearly output. By the early 1980s, the year 82 thing, um, we'd reached 100% of that. And in 1999, we were at 125%. Such numbers may be imprecise, but their trend is clear. They mark the road towards bankruptcy. So that's where that complete cycle of a forest is going to be the salvation of the province. But it's a 60-year a window or an 80-year window. Well, I, I think that, that little excerpt, Dennis, really frames our fears in the woodlot sector as we progress because the way things are going, we may be the only ones left with capital. Because well, uh, we've managed in a different style. That's a bit of a... Be, uh, I want to say a hard-ass approach. So <laughs> you guys just sit tight for 10, 15 years, and watch everything else get stripped down, and then you're sitting with what's left. Well, that, I mean, that, that's one point of that's view. That's dark. The, 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 <laughs> the cynical side, and again, going back to what I said, the, the influence on democracy, mm. uh, you know, potentially some of the real naysayers in our sector say, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to sell my woodlot now because... In five years, it's not going to be worth anything because industry is going to make a representation that we need to harvest that woodlot. Yeah. That woodlot owner doesn't care. We need to intervene. And yeah. and there, there, I wouldn't say those fears are wholesale, but there are people, intelligent people, that are scratching their head. Part of that conversation, saying, eh? 
You know, because government policy is a strange animal at times. Well, th that old problem, whether it's a forestry model challenge or whether it's a social issue, um, it's systemic and governments or elections are built on projects. So every four years, here's the agenda, every four years, here's the agenda. And one day it has to emerge that a government will go back to governing and put in place systemic approaches to things so that let people uh, work with each other to create that common solution. And it's not Pollyanna, it's like where it needs to go. Yeah. And food and you, and you guys, forestry, are the two that could really lead the way, not in the outcomes of it, but in the pattern of human behavior that allowed that to finally come together in a way that, because it's obvious you're passionate, but, but there's these solutions, like forest-based model would, or uh, community-based model would work here. Industrial model works there, but these all mesh together this way. Well, I, I, I have to smile a bit because yesterday uh, Don Floyd, the, the former dean of forestry at UNB, was on CBC Radio, the afternoon program, and he likened the situation to the Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day, where we keep <laughs> going through the same over and over. Yep. But, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it is something to be concerned about. Uh, you know, and for in our sector, as, I, as we were just saying, if we have the capital, yeah, potentially we should be in a real positive situation. Yeah. But there are cynics that think policy will take negative effect. And then there's the whole attitude of woodlawn owners. And, and I mean, the proof is there. I mean, the private land task force report that came out after the summit and the work that uh, Dr. Tom Beckley and Solange Nadeau did on a survey a number of years ago shows that in our sector, to a certain degree, the uh, the harvesting of forest products isn't the number one priority. There's a number of other priorities before the economic one comes into play. And uh, that's, in my opinion, that's great. That's what it's about because to a certain degree in a forest, and I'm speaking from managing my own woodlot for 30 years, to a certain degree you, you can have your cake and eat it too. Like you can cut wood to heat your house and sell to the sawmills, but you can still have good deer habitat, and you can still have lots of songbirds, yep. and you can still have good water quality. So yep. it, the forest is incredibly resilient, and if we treat it with the respect it deserves, it can provide us with a whole lot of our needs, not just economic return. Part of the intent of the show is that the province needs a new narrative. We need to have different ways of how we're talking about stuff that we do so that we can have breakthroughs because we're, we're jammed up against old patterns of behavior. One of those new narratives you just spoke to, and you, you just you have your cake and eat it too, but it's just the natural balance of things. And once that's respected, then you are provided for compared to economy's got to come first. And that, that tension between job, and this is to feed jobs, therefore there's the good. But we're at a critical point now, like Ronald Wright points out, that we're you overusing the resources available, we're digging into the capital and not just the interest off the capital that nature provides us. Mm -hmm. And we have gotta catch that, and you guys are on the ground with that. You're like right in the middle of it. And there's another element too, is that this stuff feeds the soul. Ronald Wright book points out, but there's lots of others, that it's more than just about wood. <laughs> it's your uh, civilization's relationship with its forests is the soul of that civilization and how it nurtures that relationship will show the soul of that community or that society. And we, we don't talk about it that way at all, which gets to you saying this study about the, the balance of the different indicators or the different variables. Because economy is a byproduct of other things. It's not our goal in itself. But we treat it like our goal in itself. We have to do this to feed the economy. Well, the economy will be just fine if we do these things over here. Like you just said, have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think, you know, we live in a very busy world and there's a lot of people, unfortunately, I don't think that are as connected to nature and forest as there were 20 years ago, 40 years ago. But I, I think as New Brunswickers, we need to kind of step back and think about as to what you just said, and, and I guess to what I just said. Yeah, exactly. Imagine having a province-wide conversation, like a big open space forum in Moncton a year from now, and how do we nurture New Brunswick's soul through its forests? And all those different players will come into play. We could do something similar on food, too, because those are two things that will sustain New Brunswick over the next hundred years. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would suggest food and local food and has got a certain amount of traction these days if you see how things are yeah. developing around. Uh, the forests, uh, I'm not sure if, if everybody understands that as well. Hmm. But, but I mean, there needs, you know, there's, there's a whole other gamut of ecosystem services that a forest provides. You know, CO2, cycling, sequestering carbon, wildlife habitat, wa the quality of our water. Yeah. I mean, one all, all you have to do is travel where there's been some kind of development or unfortunately in some cases where there's been a big clear cut adjacent to a yeah. water core, you know, a creek or river or a bay. And, and when you get the big runoffs, you see the impacts of that. You don't, you don't have to be a biologist or scientist to understand it. <laughs> you just got to stand there and look at the water turning brown. Yeah. And you know there's a problem. Yeah. I think I remember seeing a news story one time four or five years ago about Haiti and Dominican Republic. Uh, a little island, two different policies. One clear cut everything, and you literally from satellite photographs can see one half of this island with hardly any green on mm -hmm. it at all, and all the silt coming down and the other half of the island being a totally different way. Yeah, I, I think luckily we're not there yet, mm. but if we're not careful, we could get there. Mm. And, and the, the whole discussion of the economics, Dennis, I think you're, I think you're, you're bang on. I mean, because so, so this whole strategy announcement, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah, yeah well, it's an election year. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Irving's do do investments. It was really cool that there was no government dollars involved directly mm -hmm. in the retrofits, and, which, is, which is great. But somewhere in there, that discussion about, okay, so much forest equals how many jobs? And then why this growth model? Like, uh, I'm curious as to where that growth model comes from for industry. Because at some point, are you allowed to say, if we've got this many hectares of forest of this type, then we know that that provides these jobs, and then that's it. It doesn't get any bigger, it doesn't go any smaller, and it'll be that way for the next 100 years if we can shift it. Because it seems like this growth thing, oh, to be competitive on a global scale, we need to do this. Well, I want to ask, instead of taking all of that in order to feed that premise, what if you just change the premise? Mm -hmm. and maybe this is enough. Yeah, I, 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 to a certain degree, you know, on the job front, perhaps I'm not as deep a thinker, but some of the practical questions I have, we have about these jobs is, are they permanent jobs? Are they jobs, is it their attrition? Are they replacing old jobs? Uh, are they seasonal jobs? Yeah, will they, uh, go, will they go to New Brunswick? That's yeah, a whole well, other theme. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a whole bunch of questions, and then we've always contended, and we've made this point in our many meetings with government is, why is a mill or an industry job so much more important than a private job? You know, and we, we sincerely believe that the strength of our people and our, the people that work on woodlots and woodlot owners themselves is the money they earn hmm. tends to be in rural New Brunswick first because mm -hmm. that's where the forests are. Yeah. Uh, the reven the monies also cycle in the rural community. You know, they buy their diesel, they buy their tires, they fix their yeah, the equipment. The multiplier The thing. multiplier effect, yeah. uh, as opposed to big corporate money that, sure, some of it cycles locally, but some of it goes off to the bank account in uh, offshore or in Toronto. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I think those are some of the difficult questions we got to ask. And, and also, the project jobs. I've always, you know, there's going to, the announcement said 1,200 jobs in the, okay. You know, the, the project's over in two years. Mm. That's great. Mm. But what happens in two years now? Yep. Because how long is the license for? It's more than the two years, isn't it? Oh, yeah. The, the access to the wood. Yeah. And there's no predictability within the market that that market will sustain itself over 10 or 15 years or the lifetime of the investment. Mm -hmm. So a uh, little side note to support that logic, there was a piece I read in a newspaper article once about how uh, Fortune 500 companies, they tend to be held up as an example of how to generate economy and do good business. But it also pointed out that something like 40% of them are gone within 20 years. So why is that our model for where we should go as a society? If 
forty percent of them are gone within one cohort mm -hmm. or one, one generation thing. Well, we need a different model, which gets back to your point about a bigger conversation or a different conversation somehow. So tied to that, do you have a, can you map out for us some gentle solutions as to what it could be? Because what that conversation might look like or what would a best practice for New Brunswick's uh, conversation on forestry be? Well, I, <coughs> I, I, I would say the first step, Dennis, is, uh, is, is kind of a, a relationship building, trust building, because right. we, New Brunswickers have had an opportunity to express their opinion yeah. numerous times. I mean, we had the Crown Land Task Force, the Private Land Task Force, we had the summit, we had the <laughs> Ertl Report on Wood Supply, we had the Select Committees, yeah. we had, as I said earlier, the Beckley and Nadeau's uh, survey, uh, you know, there was Yako Pori uh, back in 01. There's, you know, I have two shelves on a bookcase <laughs> filled with studies that have essentially made very similar recommendations, especially with regards to woodlots, mm. that have never been incorporated. Never turned into so an action. So the challenge of having a great gathering or a big discussion yeah. is, sadly, most people, especially those that are involved in forestry, are so cynical that nobody will listen. Yeah. Uh, what's the point? Yeah. But ultimately, I mean, solutions are reached by people coming together and with the resolve to try to find a solution. Uh, the sad thing is, one, our governments, whether it's the current government or previous, are not very good at that. I don't see a very good track record. No. Uh, so could the governments operate in a, the a bubble. The four-year cycle, and there's a, even within the government, there's a difference between the poli political agenda and the bureaucratic agenda, mm -hmm. and that needs to blend. And so every time there's a turnover in government, you can lose a year waiting for the ideologies to make its way through the bureaucracy if there's policy changes or program changes. So it's almost as if uh, the, it needs to come from a third place. If all the other parts are in a lockstep, it's. And then there's the activist element too, because they're just as vocal, but without the clout, because they can't seem to create the change. But they, they talk a lot. So it's all these competing agendas, but that fits because we're talking about our land. <laughs> so that's gonna invite that conversation. Well, I mean, there's, currently there's an interesting exercise. A gentleman named Charles Terrio from up in Kedrick has producing these, these videos essentially interviews and exposés to a degree. He has a website, Is Our Forest Really Ours? Yeah. And uh, in amongst, he's done 21 episodes now, in amongst them, I mean, there's some very, you know, some former assistant deputy ministers, some former ministers uh, with, with many suggestions on how things need to be changed. I mean, the, the whole system needs to be turned on its head. For one thing, the whole value-added sector is, is you know, even though the big players do value-added to a degree, mm. <coughs> there's, more. there's much more we could be doing. Do you have a for instance? Y you know, wh well, the one for instance I have a little bit of knowledge of is we do have some window and door manufacturers. Mm. Uh, they, they use white pine. They have trouble accessing white pine in, the New, Brun in New Brunswick. So even though they're manufacturing in New Brunswick, that wood's coming from outside the province. Whereas we have a white pine resource here, but there's only one white pine sawmill left in the province, and that's J.D. Irving in Doaktown, who has a market for his own products. Uh, you know, uh, two by fours, two by six is lumber. I mean, yep. maybe there's an opportunity there to be doing more than just bundling up that framing lumber and sending it away, even though that's an important part of the industry. Maybe, you know, and there are examples, you know, Group Savo up north is a good example of, you know, they're in the hardwood business, you know, they, they make high quality hardwood products, they make pallets, mm -hmm. they make wood pellets for heating, they make briquettes, they've found a way within, you know, those kind of things. And then, and then, I mean, there's the whole energy, renewable energy, biomass, I mean, which again, we could spend two episodes on that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get Peter Corbin in and Peter Linfield in and away you guys go. Be good. Uh, but, but as I see it, you know, working with people who have basically produced the raw product, is anytime you talk about uh, an industry, 
the, the first reaction is the friction of what, where are they going to get the wood. And nobody's going to give up any wood. So that's one of the things right out of the gate also that we've said is the government needs to, instead of fully allocating all the wood from Crown land and even over allocating now we would contend, is they need to kind of hold some in reserve so when Dennis comes knocking at the door with a really good idea that for 3,000 cubic meters worth of wood he's going to create 100 jobs, that maybe that's a better way to place to put our wood than the big super efficient mill that uses 300,000 cubic meters and only creates 50 jobs. I mean, I don't really want to pit people against each other, but I think as a province we need to look at that. It can be more complex, and so we have to be willing to go into those more complex conversations mm -hmm. in order to let those little pockets appear to create the balance. Because uh, I'll try my best to para paraphrase Mr. Linfeld when he was on the show, but he was bringing in a global perspective on New Brunswick's forestry stuff. It was in a certain section of the interview with him. And more or less he was saying it's a sunset industry. So then you're left with uh, what period of time do you convert because you have a responsibility for the employment for uh, an awful lot of people for the livelihood of the province that way. But at the same time, if you pay attention to forces over here and here, that's, that's a limited decision. So what you're suggesting is, is how one way New Brunswick can move past that uh, stuckness in that paradigm. And that if there's a good idea that pops up here, but it tends to be more of a regional market, regional being the um, United States, northeastern United States, as opposed to China or India. Um, it's like we need a, a pause and then a big brainstorming session mm -hmm. and a willingness to let go of, okay, doesn't matter what we've done for the past 50 years, for the next 50 years, we need to get it together now. Yeah, and, and to kind of back out to what we said earlier about the model on Crown Land and the reference I made to a third party manager, hmm. to go to what we were discussing, the people, you know, an investor coming in looking at making a specialty product. I mean, now the, the manager and the government are one and the same. So he goes to government for that wood, it becomes a, essentially it becomes a, who can out lobby each other Whereas if the government set the goals and objectives and the policy, then the third party person makes the objective, well, no, because of policy, you know, th that wood is not available or perhaps that wood is available. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole things need to be shaken up because mm -hmm. I, I, think, uh, I think we're on a slippery slope to a certain degree. And, Again, maybe to get, talk about the strategy. I mean, another thing with the strategy, too, is uh, so far, you know, there's been uh, five announcements, or, or I guess, no, there's been three announcements so far, mm -hmm. two more to come from J.D. Irving Limited. Yeah. But we really haven't heard from the other industry in the province. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, that's a little disconcerting. I mean, we, we as woodlot owners, because we're all around the province, we want to see all the industry thrive. Yep. yep. Uh, even though we're not big fans of more crown wood being dumped in the system, yep. uh, we still want to see industry thrive all around the province. Mm -hmm. How big is your woodlot? I have 300 acres. And, and you manage that by yourself? Oh, I've... You got a small crew? No, no, I've chipped away mostly by myself over the years. Yeah. I mean, I've hired people to cut wood yeah. as I get older. <laughs> uh, and uh, even, even though I say that with a smile, yeah. but uh, I mean, uh, the demographics of woodlawn owners is we are all getting older. Sure. And in fact, Meanwhile, a lot of the wood is being cut by contractors being hired by woodlawn owners, yeah. as opposed to 30 years ago where woodlawn owners were doing a lot of their own work. Yeah. But I, I still, you know, I'm certainly, I don't flood the market. <laughs> but, I, but I'm, you know, I'll tell you, I'm quite proud of my woodlot. Well, sure, that's that connection, you know. It's, it's that voice. Uh, that's why I wanted to make that turn, that voice of I'm someone who's doing it. And it's, uh, you have a relationship with it. So you must have seen, how many years have you done your well, We've been there 31 years now. So any significant changes or something that you find just spectacular from when you first got there to how it is now? Well, I, frankly, the one thing I'm really, I've kind of changed my s strategy over the years. I mean, in the early years, working with the local marketing board, 
and at that time we had what was called Forest Extension Service getting some technical advice because mm. uh, even though I've worked in this business quite a while, I'm not a forester. Mm. And actually in the early years I didn't have a really diverse forestry background. Yeah. So I, I, I was lucky to access some really good people and you know the early years were very much concentrated on uh, softwood, spruce and fir because that's what everybody was saying you had to do. Mm -hmm. and, but I'd say probably in the last 20 years I've changed my focus over to hardwoods. And there, there's some areas I'm really amazed at. I guess the single thing, I, I'm always amazed how much a forest can change. You know, you, you'll go to a spot that you worked in five years later and you kind of look around and think, wow, <laughs> where did all this white ash come from? I never even noticed that before. And it's all growing up and looking nice straight stems. And, you know, and there's lots of maples coming. I mean, some areas that's what I've done. I'm trying to promote red oak and maple uh, and ash, some of the more Acadian species and hardwoods. Because, mm. I, frankly, I think what we've done to our hardwoods again to get back to maybe politics a bit yeah. what we've done to the hardwoods especially on crown land because we've tried to turn them into softwood plantations uh, i don't know I, I have no real strong economic basis for the statement but i think good quality hardwoods in the future are going to have some value because mm -hmm. there's not going to be very many very much of it around and speaking of that there were stories five six years ago about bird's eye maple and mm -hmm. lots of people going in and pirating it or chopping it down in the, like the black market on bird's eye maple which makes you think oh if there's a demand for that why don't yeah. we just start planting it so that 50 60 years from now it's ready yeah. to go well bird's eye is a bit of an anomaly it's basically okay. a disease in the maple tree okay. and actually what's happened to bird's eye is is bird's eye yeah, in that time period, the value was through the roof. Yeah, media gave it lots of attention. But now, it, that market, for some reason, is tanked. Okay. It, it, it's it's kind of trendy. I, yeah. I mean, the, I guess the best way you could look at it is about people who put hardwood flooring in their homes. I mean, you know, at one point in time, you had to have oak, mm. and then all of a sudden, oak, and now maple seems to be. So it, the markets, and but again, getting back to sort of the politics and... I think in terms of a forest, you manage the forest because you're never going to control the markets. Yeah, It's ludicrous to try to ma manage Whoa. your forest to, mar to match that's, the markets. Yeah, that's wag the dog stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, Tail wagging the dog. Yeah, there's, there's so many things that we need to be looking at. Well, that's, um, that sort of fits because anytime something wants to push global, the counteract or the counterintuitive is to keep it some of it local, because that's your autonomy, that's your livelihood, that's where you live. That's so similarly, we're in the food business, a lot of agribusiness now, you know, has food traveling all over North America so we could eat a certain way. But the, it's natural that some years later you're pushing back for the 100 mile diet because it's how we sustain ourselves. Um, back in the Sean Graham government days, they had this whole self sufficiency thing. But it was all geared to transfer payments and equalization payments from government. It wasn't about truly what that phrase meant to most of us, which is how are we self-sufficient? Oh, can we feed ourselves? Um, are we warm in the winter time? Do we have an education? Are we healthy? Th those things. So f forestry can lead us because just the way this conversation's gone, it integrates all the parts. It always will, always does. Back to your, uh, your turf. So for 30 years, you've seen those changes. Um, what do the next 30 years look like? Will it, does it become mature or is it always an ongoing process as part matures or what well, makes mean, you happy I, with the whole thing? Well, again, the, the, you, you know, you, you, you do the right things, you know. Many years ago I had a management plan done, hmm. you know, by a professional forester. You know, I kind of use that as a guidance document. It, it isn't a checklist of next week do this. It's, it's kind of a broad... Uh, you know, th things change. Like, for example, in southern New Brunswick, where I live, where my woodlot is, we had th this thing called the balsam woolly adelgid come for it through and, and kill most of the, the older fir. So the firs collapsed out of those stands, which normally, you know, some of it had been thin, pre-commercially thin, to allow it to grow. That would have became studwood or gone to the pulp mill. 
well now it's it's dead and on the ground but I mean those are the things you got to deal with but uh, yeah the next 30 years geez I don't know I don't even know if I'll be around in another 30 <laughs> years uh, yeah. you know and, and, and that in fact brings around another part of the transition of woodlots because managing a woodlot you know really in one generation potentially there's only going to be one major harvest although what I've done at home is, is mainly partial stuff you know I've looked at things and there's some wood that was ready to cut so we did cut some but we I have no clear cuts on my woodlot it's all some strip Select. cuts some selection yeah. cuts and and they, they've responded really nicely uh, so I mean generally I'm pleased I mean I also I, I often talk about the spiritual part of the woodlot yeah. because I mean there's places I think on everybody's woodlots where they walk with the kids walk with the grandkids or walk with your dogs and you know there's spots you'll stop and sit beside a tree <laughs> And look out at the view, or look over the water. And they talk to you. They yeah, have their own vibration, their own hum. And I think that's, again, getting back to the politics. That's the piece that's missing in terms of the relationship that companies and the government have with woodlawn owners. They just they pr try to put us into that same industrial mold that it's it's a an area of land with a bunch of trees on it that have economic value. And they're discounting all those other things. And again, y you need to take all those into account. Any last thoughts? About a minute left. Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're at a point of some serious transition uh, in terms of the people I work. You know, we're, we're being s severely challenged in our ability to continue doing the work we do. The uh, industry's being very aggressive. The relationship is less than positive, but I, again, it goes back to the whole, what I've said most of our interview about fairness and balance. There's room for us all, and there's room for different force, and I think that's what we got to move to, find a more balanced approach. And uh, because we're dealing with this huge, growing, living thing, a forest, yeah. is we got to start taking that into consideration. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for closing us out on such a good note. <laughs> okay, as always, be good, have fun, and love each other.